Hey there, everyone. I've been doing some research, uh, trying to get my game plan together going into the next few months about this, these food shortages, the food prices, the shrinkflation, inflation, all of these things, right, that are bound to uh, get, uh, you know, we don't know how much worse over the next of the, the course of the next few months or even years, uh, but it there's no signs of it getting any better. So what I wanted to do is do a video today about some of these things that are concerning and some of the things that we can do to, to kind of mitigate the issues that we could possibly face here coming up in the future and some of the things that we just can't do anything about and why it's happening. So um, with this, I've, I've got a couple articles from a couple of mainstream websites uh, because I wanted to look at what their thought process, their opinions on this this whole food shortage thing is because it's a real thing. It's not just a, a prepper thing, right? It is a real thing across the board. People are concerned about it. But I also wanted to get that perspective from preppers as well, which I, which I do all the time. And I usually, I tend to gravitate more towards the prepper perspective rather than the mainstream because the mainstream just, they don't give it the credit I think that it deserves because it is something that could get really bad and, and get really bad for a lot of people uh, depending on your situation. But they kind of gloss over it just like they do with everything in the mainstream media. So I tend to take a little bit more of the prepper perspective perspective and the prepper um, preparedness mentality rather than the, oh, this is, this might get bad and it's going to suck, but we'll pull through it. You know, the rah, rah. Yeah. I don't buy that stuff. But at any rate, I found a couple articles from them, which um, they talk about a few different things uh, that we should be concerned about. But I think there's a bigger picture with all of this, this stuff, because with when it comes to like in this article they've got oranges right here they've got lettuce or they've got uh cooking oil but there's a bigger picture with all of this everything is tied together it's it's kind of like spokes in a wheel or a house of cards that you know when one thing is expensive or one they're short in supply of one thing that affects a lot of other things so in this article right here they talk about the first one they've got here is beef they say here is, uh, according to Beef Magazine, the USDA estimates that the average American will consume 5.6% less, 5 .6 less beef in 23 than they did in 22. The steepest decline in consumption in 40 years. Consumers' choice to buy less beef is related to the economic concerns, such as inflation, lackluster GDP growth, and escalating beef costs brought on by the ongoing shortage of meat. According to the Washington Times, the devastating drought in Texas, which was responsible for 14 for 14 percent of the U.S. beef supply, led to a lack of grass feed for cows. Meanwhile, alternative feeds are currently too expensive to be cost effective. And this sort of goes into the fertilizer crisis that we had talked about just a few months ago. Right. Uh, all of these things, especially the lettuce right here, they talk about with lettuce. You're talking about produce basically across the board, not just lettuce like they have in this one article. And you you think about the wheat, the, the war in Ukraine and what that's affecting and the fertilizer that help all these crops grow. And then you've got drought conditions in certain areas. So it's, it's almost like the, all these pieces are coming together to just create a massive problem uh, coming down the line. Uh, in here, they have beer. Beer is, you know, for some people, this may be a huge concern, but what they're talking about in this article is the aluminum used for beer. So when you think about the other things that this would affect, you, in this, they talk about uh, pet food because during the pandemic, people were drinking at home. So they used a lot of beer or they drink a lot of beer. The pet adoption went up, so people are buying more canned food. So aluminum shortages are what's causing this, not the beer itself. But think about the other things. You've got canned foods. Everything that comes in aluminum is aluminum is going to be in short supply. So what does that do? It increases the price of the product that these people are trying to sell. And when we get into shrinkflation in a bit, maybe it, it, it decreases the size of of the product that they have to make to put, you know, that stuff in. So champagne, not too worried about that. Oranges, cooking oil is a big one because cooking oil is something, especially vegetable oil and corn, it goes into a, a whole lot of different things. So it's not just the cooking oil that you buy at the store to put in your pantry. 
It is all the things that are made with that cooking oil. These companies that put together these, you know, frozen meals and all of these different things purchase gallon. I mean, hundreds of gallons of this stuff uh, to make the food that they do. So that is a huge issue. Those things will rise. Along with that, You've got bakeries, you've got businesses, restaurants, all of these people that uh, rely on these cooking oils uh, to make the food that they make. So those prices could rise as well uh, with the shortages. So with the shortages, it may not be a completely out of stock type situation, but the shortages are going to cause prices to rise on top of the inflation that we're already seeing. So again, it's just that, that house of cards. Uh, butter, which is interesting because most butter, and this kind of goes back to oil, most butter is not even butter these days. The can't believe it's not butter crap. Uh, again, made with a whole bunch of that oil, the vegetable oil, the corn oil. Um, so while butter may be in short supply, the the other stuff that the you know the not so much butter <laughs> is going to be in so short supply as well. Corn is a big one because we overuse corn because corn is in everything these days, basically. Uh, and, I, and globally, we overuse corn. So a corn shortage affects a whole lot more than just the corn on the cob on your dinner table, uh, which is all we really should be kind of using it for. But it affects all of that stuff as well. Eggs, I know everybody, everybody's probably heard or went and bought some eggs and, and had sticker shock with it. Um, eggs are one of those things that is it's just outrageous right now. The bird flu is a big reason for that. I mean, there's a, a few different factors. We've gotten to the point where it used to be we own some chickens, and it's it's more expensive to own chickens than just go buy it at the store. Not, not a whole lot more expensive, but it is more expensive. It's almost getting to the point now where eggs, it's almost cheaper to actually have chickens and grow and raise chickens than it is uh, to get them from the grocery store. So uh, it is one of those situations. And, and being wintertime right now, our, our chickens aren't producing much anyway. So we'll have to go to the grocery store uh, and get some eggs. So, uh, But coming in the next couple of months, we'll be back on track. Plus, we're going to be getting some smaller chickens. But at any rate, eggs is another one of those that is right now we're seeing the, the big impact of the avian flu and all of these different things. So uh, how much does that go up or decline in the future? And again, restaurants, uh, people that are making this food, they depend on a whole lot more eggs than we do. So what is that going to do to the price of everything, basically? Uh, tomatoes, bread, the whole Ukraine thing going on, all the wheat that they export, all the, the you know, the fertilizer and all that stuff. Uh all of this is a huge deal. And I, I think it's interesting that here in the United States, we talk about these shortages and the, the food shortages and everything. But there are third world countries that are absolutely seeing this far worse than we ever will. And, and they're seeing it right now as well. But I think in the coming you know year or so, we're going to see a lot of the stuff that they're already seeing. Maybe not to the level that they're seeing it. But we're going to start seeing that stuff as well. And the simple things like flour, beans, all these simple things um, are going to, uh, you know, it, it's going to be good to have them in your stockpile, I suppose. Uh, interesting enough, uh, China is, and this is my conspiracy brain, but China stockpiling all sorts of this stuff, the, the grains, the rice, the wheat, the corn, all of this stuff. So why, what, what do they know? Uh, or, you know, I, I don't want to say what they know that we don't because I'm sure the American that our uh, politicians know as well. They just don't act on it uh, because that's just what they do. They wait until something gets really bad and then they act on it. Uh, but what do they know or why are they doing what they're doing? Basically, it makes me wonder about all that stuff. So at any rate, I'll get back to this olive oil again with the oils, baby formula. We've we've all seen this going on Uh that's it for this one. Uh, this article right here is pretty interesting. It talks about food shortages may get even worse in 2023. And I just wanted to read these first couple of paragraphs because uh, it's pretty interesting. If you were hoping the new year would mark a renewed era of abundance for the U.S. food system, we have some bad news. The various food shortages that have defined the past 12 months, uh, butter, baby formula, eggs, are not only expected to continue 
but experts are also predicting they could get even worse in 2023. Uh, CNBC reports an ec economic recession is likely to hit in the early months of the new year as inflation, environmental catastrophes, and ongoing fertilizer shortages continue to wreak havoc. I believe 2023 is going to be rough, worse than this year, Tennessee dairy farmer and outspoken agricultural activist Stephanie Nash recently told Fox News. We're going to have supply chain shortages and we're going to have increase in food prices at the grocery store. This this to me is concerning because the stuff that we grow, the stuff that we grew last year is the stuff we're using this year. So the stuff that we grew two years ago was what we were using last year. Now, coming into this year after we've gone through the, you know, the fertilizer shortages and all of these things, that's going to affect our food supply coming up in the next year. So it's kind of people don't don't necessarily give it the, the credit that it deserves. But the food that we grew a year ago is the food that we're going to be eating. So that is, you know, it's setting up for a very tough 2023, in, in my opinion. And all of this stuff is global. Uh, these days that we used to grow quite a bit of wheat in the United States and now we don't grow as much because farmers just can't make a profit on it. They can't make uh, enough money to make it feasible for them to grow it. So that's why the Ukraine uh, out there, Ukraine and Russia, I think they're 70 percent. I don't know what the actual number is, but they're responsible for a major portion of of the wheat market uh, because just American farmers don't grow it out here. Corn is used in everything. So uh, the demand for corn is super high and with drought conditions and, and things like that, you know, where does that lead everything? And then you've got the drought conditions, the fertilizers, the, you know, the feed for cattle and all those different things that seem to be adding up on top of the fact of that. They just, you know, they want to steer us away from meeting meat in the first place. So, you know, I, I, I suppose if you were some sort of conspiracy theorist like me, you would think maybe there is some sort of benefit that they're seeing to all of this stuff happening. So um, at any rate, I, I just thought that was pretty interesting as far as um, what different people are saying about this. And it's not just a, a prepper, the sky is falling type thing. There are um, legitimate, you know, very smart people out there that work in the business saying, uh, you know, tighten up your tighten up your belt. It's going to get pretty bad here. So, uh, and at the end of this, I, I'm going to go over a, a couple of things that I'm doing with this. But I wanted to talk a little bit about shrinkflation first, because this is another way that these companies will, instead of having to increase their bottom line, increase the price of their product and make people more hesitant about actually purchasing it, maybe I'll get to something else, maybe I'll get to generic brand, what they do is shrink the size of their product so they, they basically save on the bottom line. They don't have to raise their prices, but what they do is, is give you less of that product. Uh, down here, basically, it explains what shrinkflation is. Uh, prices of consumer goods have increased at the fastest rate in 40 years. The term shrinkflation describes brands selling smaller amounts of product at the same price as before. It's a sneaky way for brands to hide growing prices. And what I wanted to do was in this article right here, uh, there are some examples, and I wanted to just pull these up and show you. Uh, and even and these are talking about the the shrinkflation that's just happened recently in the last year or so. Uh, when we think back to you know the size of candy bars when we were in our twenties and thirties, or the size of bags of chips, or the size of all these different things, uh, they were much bigger. Even you know kids snacks, Twinkies and Ho Hos and all those things, much bigger than they are these days. And it's continuing to go down. Uh, and it, it's sort of that death by a thousand cuts thing where they decrease it in these really small increments that you don't really notice until you look back at what it used to be. Uh, so Frito-Lay shrank their bag from 9.75 ounces to 9.25, which is not a lot, you know, for us. But when you think about how many millions of bags of Doritos they make per year, uh, a half an ounce per bag, uh, they're saving quite a bit on the bottom line. And with this, um, they don't have to increase the price of their product while they can still maintain that profit that they make. Uh, Gatorade did uh, something that's a, a little bit tricky right here. They reduced their, um, their product from 32 to 28 ounces, so 4 ounces, 14% drop. But they changed the shape of their bottle uh, to make it look like 
it is the same same amount, same size. You're getting the same size, but it's less of the product. And you don't even really notice it, uh, you know, at the store. But they notice it as they do their books uh, and, and figure out how much profit they've made throughout the year. Uh, this is another thing that some of these companies do. Domino said that they were going to be cutting down the number of chicken wings from 10 to 8. Uh, and the next one here, same type of situation. Burger King reduced its chicken nuggets from um, from 10 pieces to 8. So uh, these, and we've probably, you've probably noticed this over time too. When you were younger, you'd go out to eat and things were larger, things were different. And these days it's more, uh, you know, it's it's more profit driven, I suppose, than than customer driven these days. Uh, Walmart sells uh, great value paper towels, and they've dropped from 168 sheets per roll to only 120 sheets. So they increase the amount. The uh, same thing as the food. This is just a paper product, but they decrease the amount. They keep it at six rolls or whatever it is, eight rolls. So you think you're getting the same amount, but it just doesn't go as far as it used to. And you don't really think about it. Most people don't really think about it. Uh, but it just doesn't go as far as it used to. And you have to go out and you have to buy more, right? Uh, Hershey's Kisses. We've, we've, I'm sure we've all noticed this. The, pri- the size of candy bars and all of this different stuff has gone down through the years. Um, in the last year, they cut it from an 18-ounce an pack. Uh, they cut it down almost two ounces. Not a whole lot, right? But over the course, I wonder what it used to be as far as cost and, 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 and amount used to be 10, 20 years ago. Uh, I bet you it was insanely different. And that's really not that long ago. Uh, Hefty mega packs went from 90 bags to 80 bags. So they cut 10 bags out. That's quite a bit. You know, when you're thinking about how long uh, a a thing of trash bags is going to last you, uh, 10 less bags, you're talking a month. You know, maybe a month, maybe two months, depending on your situation. Uh, Reese's, we talked about candy bars, granola bars, Pringles, a uh, UK's uh, supermarket shaved 50 grams off of its some of its ready meals. Uh, pet food Royal Canaan's can of cat food weighs now weighs 5.1 ounces down from 5.9 ounces. So you're getting less of of just about everything, and it's a big way for these companies to continue making the profits they're making. Uh, and continu- continuing to sell the amount of products they were selling before without you really even noticing it, uh, the, the differences. So you think that their price is staying the same. You think that everything is fine. You think that that thing of trash bags is the same one that you were buying two years ago, uh, but for some reason, it's not lasting you as long. You're having, you're having to go out and buy more of those more often. So it's their way of doing this stuff. Uh, to sort of trick the consumer into thinking, okay, hey, we're not raising our prices as much as uh, you know other people are, so you should stick with us. So I just think it's it's really interesting how all of this stuff comes back together, and it all. I think it was Brian the other day on our Survival Preppers show talked about how it all comes back to the economy, uh, and that's exactly what it is. In this, uh, let me see here. In this poll I did a little while back on Survivalist Prepper, we talked about uh, some of the main concerns for people heading into 2023. And the top two uh, were the inflation and the economy and shortages. And, And like I said, Brian was talking about this the other day. It all comes down, every single thing on this list actually, all comes down to the economy. If the economy is getting better, uh, that means that other things are happening. The shortages are are starting to go away. The prices are starting to come down. But if the economy is getting worse or if the shortages are getting worse, the economy is going to get worse. If the economy gets worse, then civil unrest is going to get worse and societal decay is going to get worse. I mean, all of this stuff sort of goes together uh, like spokes in a wheel. So that's what I see happening coming you know coming up in the next few months six months year two years i mean who knows uh but i see all of this i don't i just don't see how uh anything could be getting better now how much worse i don't know i mean we don't know that all we can do is sort of prepare now and get this stuff ready but we don't know exactly how bad it's going to get it could get really bad uh but we just don't know it could even out and it could just main we could just maintain this world of suck for the next year 
Uh, and then it, you know, then we just kind of kick the ball down the road and see what happens next year. But uh, we just don't know. So some of the things I'm doing now, I'm trying to be as proactive about all of this stuff as I can. And that's why I was I'm doing so much research on this stuff, seeing what it is that's likely to be in really short supply coming up. Uh, building up my food storage while I can, while the prices are, even though they're sort of high right now, uh, they could get a whole lot higher in the future. That's why I went out last year, about six months ago, I went out and bought a, a small little chest freezer. Uh, I can't remember what size it is. It's about 200 bucks though. Uh, and it's solely for me. That's what I'm going to be, or that's what I am putting in there. Uh, that way, if I see a a good price on beef or ground beef or pork or, uh, you know, chicken or anything like that. I can buy as much as, as I want or as much as I think I should get with that and, and throw it in the freezer. So having the, the storage space available uh, to actually stock up a little bit is a good idea. And that's why I went and got that just small enough that it'll fit down. It, it'll either fit in a, a bedroom or a basement or somewhere like that. And what my thought process was, was the 200 bucks that it cost if this the price of meat and goes up like goes up like I expect it to, and it has gone up um, since I first bought it, then I'm going to easily be able to make back that two hundred dollars that I spent on that on the price that the the money that I didn't have to spend on that meat when it was up at a much higher price. It just gives you the 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 ability to be a little bit more flexible and be a little bit more proactive with this stuff. If you see something on sale, if you if you see something's a good price or you hear stories about how meat is going up here or there, you can kind of be proactive about that. Buy a little bit extra and stock up. That way you're not one of the people out there ransacking the the meat department, grabbing everything off the shelves because you hear it's it's going to be off the shelves in a day or two. So everybody goes out and and grabs it. So and the, and the same thing goes for all of these long long shelf life foods. The more you can get now, uh, the better off you're going to be with all of that uh, going into the future. If everything remains the same, hey, you've got a fully stocked. You, you basically got a grocery store in your basement. You don't have to, you know, spend the money on gas to go to the grocery store, which is another reason why food prices are probably going to go up because fuel prices are absolutely insane. So uh, as far as heating your home and all that, maybe gas prices go up and down. So who knows with that? But I know that energy prices to heat your home uh, are going up, and that's also affecting these businesses that produce all of this food. So that's just going to add to the food prices. Uh, one thing with, you know, if you hear things about food shortages, I, I mean, like in that poll, there was a, a few people that talked about what they're seeing in their area. And I love hearing that stuff because I want to know what, what other people are seeing and what possibly might come my way. But it doesn't mean that what they're seeing is going to happen here. It doesn't mean what I'm seeing is going to happen somewhere else, too. So you really have to, you know, pay attention to how things are, are going. You know, really look at the shelves when you go to the grocery store and see which things are not on the shelves. And think about if it is it just an inventory thing? Is the store being lazy? Sometimes that happens up here where we live. Uh, they just don't have the stock uh, regularly that they do in a, in a larger city. Uh, or is it something bigger than that? Is it a, an issue of the, the supply just not being there? So pay attention to those things. But don't, don't think that because it's happening somewhere else that it's going to happen to you as well. And along the same lines, don't think that it's because it's happening somewhere else or that it's not going to happen to you, basically, because it very well could. So just keep all of that in mind when you're building up your food storage. Um, one last thing on this is the, the use of credit cards. I really hesitate to say... You know, there's a reason or if you need to use your credit card, go ahead, uh, because I just think credit cards and preparedness are at two opposite ends of the spectrum. But a, a situation, I suppose, where I could see this being something that you might want to do is if you see you're, there's a really good deal on a certain type of meat or something that you can put in your food storage and you know you're going to be able to pay that off, you know, the, your check, your next paycheck's coming in a week and you know you can pay that off before the interest hits. I can see a situation like that where you might want to take advantage of that deal. But if you don't pay that off and that interest hits, say it's, uh, you know, you saved 10 bucks on whatever you bought, but that interest hits and you have to pay $15, you're losing money on that. Uh, and then, you know, say you don't pay it off the next month again, you're losing money again. So it's sort of pointless 
uh, to go to spend that money, put it on a credit card if you're not going to pay it off. So, uh, you know, the choice is completely up to you. That's just how I think. I hate using credit cards because the interest to me is like throwing away free money, giving them money uh, for absolutely nothing, and it drives me nuts. But if you find a good deal and that's the only way you're going to be able to take advantage of the deal and you know you're going to be able to pay that off before the interest hits, um, you know, why not? Um, at any rate, I'd love to get your guys' thoughts and ideas. You know, what are you seeing right now in your areas? Like I said, I really like hearing that because you kind of get the pulse of of the country and what different people are seeing in different places around the around the country. And what are your concerns as far as shortages? Anything that I didn't address in this coming up in 2023 or the, or the future, anything past that, what are your concerns with all this stuff? Because honestly, I don't know. But the preparedness side of me wants to make sure that regardless of how this all unfolds and all this un- turns out, um, I'm going to be as prepared as I possibly can without just going into a whole bunch of debt and all that because, um, you know, it's just not a good idea. Like I said, debt is the opposite of preparedness. Uh, but I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on what you're seeing, what you think's coming around the corner and all of that. Uh, but with that, that's it for today. Take care and prepare. We'll talk to you all later.